Evolutionists put all of their faith in Darwinism. They present it to children in school as fact when in reality, evolution is only a theory. After 150 years, evolution is still just a theory. Or so they say. The fact is that evolution isn't even a theory. When defending their naturalistic religion, they cavalierly compare it to gravity, claiming both are theories. Of course, they're forgetting that it's actually the law of gravity. Ultimately, not only is evolution not a theory, it's not even science. It's merely a bunch of assumptions. So why are all of these supposed scientists wasting our time? I had to investigate. The word theory has its origins in the Greek word theoria, which is translated as looking at, viewing, or beholding. Greek philosopher Pythagoras, while championing the idea of subduing emotions and bodily desires to help the intellect function, changed the word to mean a passionate, sympathetic contemplation of mathematical knowledge. He considered this intellectual pursuit the way to reach the highest plane of existence. Aristotle, however, contrasted the term with practice. While both practice and theory involve thinking, the goals are different. Theoretical ideas consider things humans do not move or change, such as nature. On the other hand, practice involves thinking with an aim to desired actions. Thus, theories are analytical tools for understanding, explaining, and making predictions about a given subject matter. At no point in antiquity, however, was a theory just a mere assumption or guess. A scientific theory has three specific requirements. One, it must be derived from observed evidence. As a theory is a model for understanding observed phenomena, it only makes sense that there are observed phenomena to explain. Two, it must explain the observed evidence. This is what separates a theory from a law or a fact. Facts and laws are certainly observed phenomena, but that is all they are. A theory is designed to explain why or how the phenomena occur. Three, and most importantly, it must be able to predict future evidence. This is where the word assumption comes up. An assumption is how a hypothesis is formed and a prediction is made. The process goes like this. If we assume theory A to be true, we should expect result B when we perform experiment or observation C. So, for example, we could define theory A as the presence of the teacher in the classroom affects the noise level in the room. A hypothesis would then be, if we assume that the presence of the teacher in the classroom affects the noise level in the room, we should expect to see the noise level of the classroom to increase when the teacher leaves the room. The increase would be the expected result, and the absence of the teacher would be the experiment. If we do see an increase in the noise level after the teacher leaves, we can say that the theory has support, but it cannot be said to be proven. A theory is never proven. It is only tested and supported. There could be other factors causing a change in noise level. For this reason, there is one more requirement for a scientific prediction, falsifiability. Scientific tests are actually designed with the possibility of disproving the theory as well. For this, we need what is called a null hypothesis, which states the condition that would disprove the theory. In this example, the null hypothesis is, if we don't see an increase in noise level in the classroom when the teacher leaves, then we know that the assumption that the teacher's presence affects noise level is wrong, and we must either reject our theory or revise it. It is also assumed that a theory must be wrong to some degree, but using these premises, the strength of a theory is evaluated by its ability to explain the evidence and predict the evidence. On July 5th, 1687, Isaac Newton published Principia Mathematica, defining amongst his laws of motion the law of gravitation. Formulating the inverse square law, he unified the motions of an apple falling to earth with the orbits of the planets as the result of the same calculable force. As remarkable as it was, it merely described how objects moved in relation to each other. It did not explain why. It was, after all, a law, not a theory. The why was proposed in 1915 when Albert Einstein published his theory of general relativity. In Einstein's model, the cause of gravitation was the warping of space-time due to an object's mass. Extrapolating from the equation E equal mc squared, this model actually predicts the movements of the planets more accurately than Newton's laws. But as accurate and predictive as the model may be, it still cannot be proven. It will always be a theory of gravity and assumed to be wrong on some level, even if we don't know for sure what that level is. 
Evolution, however, is a theory containing several other theories, all based on the fact that populations of organisms do, in fact, change. We can observe changes occurring, and we know that these changes correlate to the frequency of alleles in the genome. Among other applications, scientists use this knowledge every year to develop new vaccines as cold, flu, and even AIDS viruses continue to evolve. We can determine that at least part of the reason for these changes is mutation, but Darwin's theory, developed before the discovery of DNA, proposed that a determining factor for the survival of a particular allele is the environment itself. In this model, known as natural selection, the traits of an organism are selected by its tendency to reproduce more often in its particular environment. Human beings had already been artificially selecting traits in plants and animals for millennia. By selecting preferred traits in wolves, human beings managed to selectively breed over 300 morphologically distinct breeds of dog. By selecting preferred traits in mustard plants, humans have managed to selectively cultivate hundreds of cultivars such as cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli. The list goes on. As I demonstrated using the worm Naresia cuminata in episode 66, we know that two populations of the same species, if isolated for long enough, will eventually lose the ability to interbreed. Known as speciation, this reproductive isolation makes any genetic and morphological differences permanent. The theory that all species have descended from a common ancestor is known as common descent. Building upon the knowledge that populations do change over time and the observed fact that these changes correlate to specific gene frequencies, we can predict that the appearance of entire sequences of genes will correlate to a relationship between species. By applying the same genetic test we use to confirm relationship between people, we can confirm relationship between species in accordance with the predictions of common descent. As it turns out, the genetic family tree correlates to the phylogenetic and morphological family tree almost perfectly. Legally, this is proof of common descent, but scientifically, common descent will always be a theory. Creationism, on the other hand, is derived from the religious claim that a creation event occurred in the past with all variations of life, known as kinds, being created separately. This can be intuitively seen by the mere observation that there is a wide variety of life that all seems quite diverse and unrelated. The appearance of relationship between different species can be explained by the simple proposition of a common designer. As intuitive as this is, it is also where falsifiability becomes the determining factor. If we don't see a relationship between every different species correlating to their proposed relationship, the theory of common descent would be falsified and we would have to either revise or abandon it. On the other hand, if we don't see a relationship between every living species correlating to their morphological similarities, it would have no effect at all on the common designer argument. There is nothing preventing a common designer from having the creativity to devise completely unrelated methods of heredity in every living creature. It is for this lack of a null hypothesis that creationism cannot claim to make scientific predictions as it is compatible with any result. For this reason, to date there has been no scientific discovery ever made by testing a hypothesis derived from the assumption of a creation event, let alone a six-day creation event 6,000 years ago. As gravity is a theory based on the observed law of universal gravitation, evolution, and more specifically, universal common descent, is a theory based on the fact that evolution does occur. Even if it's ultimately false, it has real-world applications benefiting us medically and agriculturally, just to name two ways. Whether or not creationism is true, however, it is scientifically useless and has no real-world applications. The comparison between the two is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.